God bless you, body of Christ. We thank God for you being with us today on this Lord's Day. Every day is the Lord's Day, and we just continue to rejoice and, and, and give his name the praise, and we thank you for allowing us to come into your home, your jobs, your cars, wherever you are, whatever platform you're streaming on. We thank God for each and every one of you. We give honor to God today, for he's still our God. So we worship him in spirit and in truth, and without him we are nothing. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for yet another day, giving us another opportunity at life. Pray, Lord, that you will continue to touch each and every one of us as we do your will. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we come together today with a hybrid audience, we've got some in the sanctuary. and You're welcome to be able to come. Uh, you don't have to register anymore. You can just come on Wednesdays, and we'd be more than glad to have you. And then for all of you that are watching virtually, I know that everybody's ready to get back in the church as soon as they can, and we encourage you to come back. We used to have a, a, a room full of people at uh, noonday, and I say this, and I don't take it lightly because I'm sensitive to those who may have health issues or immune issues. We understand your situation, but for everybody who I'm talking to, including myself, if you can go to Golden Corral, and you can go to Ross, and you can go to Walmart, and you can go to Food Line, you ought to be able to come to church. So don't stop, let's stop those excuses and come on back to church. We're safe. We're doing what we're supposed to do. And sometimes you're not going to get the same thing that the people that are in the sanctuary are getting. You're getting uh, sometimes uh, the edited version when you can get the original. Those who can't be here, we understand. But also we're looking to get back together and be a part of the corporate believers in the body of Christ. So unless you have that issue and cannot get here, and we're praying that the Lord will continue to give you everything that you need and continue to protect you, but also for those who are able, come on back to Bible study, come on back to church, and let's continue to worship the Lord together. Ain't nothing like being in the service. Uh, we are praying for Reverend Dr. Leon Newton. As many of you have heard from yesterday, uh, Sister uh, Reverend Adrian Newton, his wife, passed away, and uh, that was unexpected, and though uh, some health issues over the years, We've not been in a situation where we expected her to be able to, to uh, transition, transition from labor to reward, but know that God is still able, and Reverend Dr. Leon Newton is still encouraged, and uh, Reverend uh, Adrian Newton was a soldier of the cross, and she uh, fought the good fight, finished her course, and kept the faith. But on yesterday uh, uh, afternoon, um, the Lord decided to be able to let her slip from labor to reward. And I'm, I know right now that she's with the Lord for she was saved and she didn't mind professing her faith. So we, we're praying for Reverend Dr. Leon Newton and, and the church family of Simon Temple because she was an intricate part. And um, it, being able to bring them together and, 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 uh, and a ceremony and him being here in this sanctuary, in the old sanctuary when they got saved and then them coming together and then just as the story goes on, it's a wonderful story. And this is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior for all the day long. And we thank God. As soon as we have information uh, on her homegoing celebration, we'll let uh, you know. People have been calling from all over the country uh, for she worked with Reverend Dr. Chandler, R.J. Chandler, and the acolytes of the Amy Zion Church, a very intricate part of the National Christian Education Department. So we've been getting calls since yesterday and text messages from all over the country. And I just thank God for each and every one of you praying uh, for Reverend Dr. Leon Newton uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the Newton family, along with the Simon Temple Church family. We have suffered a great loss here and, and our lives will never be the same. But we thank God for the redemptive blood of Jesus Christ. And she gets a chance, <coughs> excuse me, gets a chance to be with the Lord that she talked about so much. So our hearts are heavy, but the Lord is still faithful. With that, we've lost two ministers in our, in our um, ministerial ranks over the last six weeks, and that of the Reverend Ruby Jones and that of the Reverend Adrian Newton. And there's been a lot of loss throughout the uh, families of those of Simon Temple, those who watch us virtually, part of our virtual church, and the Amy Zion Church, and also the community in the kingdom. So the day we're going to deal with, dealing with loss and grief, dealing with loss and grief. And this may be apple pro as we overcome loss and grief. Um, we say overcome, and I said deal with, but a better subject is on the screen, overcoming loss and grief. Because you will have to deal with it. I don't care who you are, you're going to have to deal with loss and grief. As sure as you're born, you're going to die. 
That, that is just, that's it. And we know that's going to happen. But we've got to understand for those who are Christian, that is not the final resting place. That's not our finality. That's not the end of the story. So we've got to deal with it. But when you go through it, uh, how many of you gone through de uh, death or loss before and your life were never the same? How many, how many, or it hurt you or it brought something out of you? And that's normal. That is normal. And I think the, the issue comes, and, and, and I'm going to be meeting with our acolytes. Reverend, Reverend Adrian Newton uh, was able, and I use her as an example, was able to nurture some of our children now who are now in college. And she, you know, last 15 years, she's been doing the acolyte ministry. So some of these persons who are 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, she, that's, she was the introduction of servitude in the church. So they are having a tough time, and I'm going to be meeting with all of them and their parents later on this evening so that I can be able to talk with them because, you know, some people say, well, just pray. It's going to be all right. Yeah, I mean, that's so insensitive sometimes. And, and, I'm, and I'm a man of faith. I'm a man of prayer. But how many of you know sometimes you need to hear more than just pray? You need to hear more than it's just going to be all right. You need some comfort. And when you need comfort, you need it from the Lord Jesus Christ, but also from other people. You get so many people in, insensitive. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, my wife and I, of course, had privy to this information before most people, and we talked and prayed before I, get, I put this information out to everybody else's, you know, uh, in sensitivity and, and respect for Reverend Dr. Newton and his family, uh, her brother, her uncle, and all the other people that were there. And, and, and as we were doing this, I was, you know, after we put it out, uh, I knew we started getting bombarded with text messages. And Sister McKeith and one person texted me, this is what they texted me. I didn't know she was sick, what happened? You know, and, and you know, understand, our, our natural, our natural uh, fleshly is want to know what happened. But we often don't think that people are going through. So for our need to know, or our want to know, not need to, but want to know, sometimes can be so insensitive that you will even hinder or hurt the grieving process or the loss process of who's going through it. Or to come up insensitive and say, well, you're going to be all right. My so-and-so passed away uh, two years ago. You, that's insensitive. You, you don't realize that you think you're comforted, but you've got to understand you're going to have to use the words of Jesus Christ. Because when you use those words, you can't go wrong. But even with that, you've got to be troubled. You've got to be careful what you say. So I want everybody to just say, be careful what you say. And I say that, I don't say it in meanness. Sometimes people don't mean no harm. They don't mean no harm. But you've got to be careful during that time. Um, it, it's said, and my father in the ministry, Reverend Lawrence Turner, told us this, this Sister Townsend. She said, preachers, there's two things you can never mess up or better not mess up, a wedding and a funeral. And, and we looked at him and said, why? He said, because those are the most memorable moments of those that you serve, and you can't never correct what you've done. And that thing messed with me, so I'm always very, very uh, uh, sensitive to that. I remember when Brother McKellar, when your wonderful sister went on to be with the Lord, and I remember Sister Isabel went on to be with the Lord. Sister Isabel had lived a wonderful long life, been a, a member of this church uh, from Beaver Creek days. But just because she had been here and lived a long life, I don't go to Brother McKellar and say, well, she lived a long life, you ought to be happy about it. No, we, 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 we mourn together, we pray together, because that's the loss of somebody in your life. And you got to be careful because you don't know the connection between the people. And, and fortunately, Brother McKellar is a man of faith and a, and a man of worship, and he had the sensitivity to know to call on the Lord. What if it would have been somebody who did not know? And they didn't have a strong faith in God. And then they react the way you're coming at them. So I want to deal with dealing with loss and grief today. And I want to put up John 14. I want to put up John 14. It's not in your notes. Those of you who don't have these notes or don't, are not present, you can download at simontemple.com. It says, and I want you to put up the King James Version. Can you hit the King James Version? I know that's easy to do. But if you can, do the King James. Uh, thank you, sir. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believeth also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am, ye may be also. And I prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, ye may be also. This is what Jesus Christ gives as he's about to, as he's going away. 
to be able to give us comfort. And I know at every funeral, or, or at least over the years, you've heard that a hundred times, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believeth in the Father, believeth also in me and my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be also. It's a wonderful scripture. It brings comfort, but then it still leaves questions. And when it leaves questions, we as the body of Christ, as believers, have to be able to deal with it ourselves, but also we must have the mindset to help others go through it. Now, no stranger to grief. You've got to understand that Jesus was no stranger to grief. He had to go through in a physical. You've got to understand, and you can write this down and hold it in your memory bank, Jesus came in two forms. He was human and divine. Human and divine. And by him being human, the humanistic factor is as that he was in the flesh. So God sent his only begotten son. So when he sent him, he sent him in flesh. But the divine nature or his spirit was all divine. So when he deals with that, he's wrapped in the flesh. But yet he's operating in spirit, which means Jesus felt just like we felt. And when he felt, this is just like uh, the scripture uh, that's, that we used to use in vacation Bible school, that when you don't know a scripture, it was two words. Jesus wept, all right? So when Jesus wept, y'all, y'all don't never have to do that. I, I had a LD, I had learning disability, so I had to use what I had. So I use that scripture every time the mama slapped me and said, you need to learn something more. So it said, Jesus wept. Jesus had a need to, 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 to weep. He had a, 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 a need to release. And by him being able to do that, he's dealing with loss and grief. He not only had loss and grief by those who had betrayed him, those who were trying to, uh, in his own inner circle, who was trying to be able, so we talk about Judas a lot, who sold him for, for silver or sold him for money. We also got to deal with his other disciples who decided that, listen to Peter, Peter's sitting up there and the little girl comes up to him and said, ain't you one of them? And he said, I don't know who you are. Jesus already said you're going to deny me thrice. So now he has lost in grief. But now notice what he says when he gets there. He says, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my, thine will, but thine will be done. He realizes his departure was at, at, hand, at, at his time was at hand. Uh, the, the mother of Jesus is, is crying because, and, and you had to say, Mary, don't you weep, Martha, don't you moan, because grief is inherently within our DNA and our system because that deals with our flesh. Now, when we deal with that, I want to go to 1 Peter 2 and 23. Now, understand this. I'm going to deal with it from a loss but I'm also dealing with from a humanistic factor of Greece, grief. When they hurled the insults at him, insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judged justly. That was the divine part in him. The divine part is that I'm going to surrender my will to God's will. Let me tell you something. When you're going through grief and loss, your flesh will start to make you think things that your spirit don't agree with. Because your flesh inherently wants to be able to grieve to a point where there's no hope of a return. But your, 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 your spirit says, greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. My spirit says, uh, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in the Father, believe it also in me. You've got to deal with that part. That's the, the, the humanistic rather than the divine. But the divine ought to always be able to go over. Now, we are not the divine nature of God, but we share in his spirit. So the spiritual side of us says that I'm not going to let this get to me. I'm not Lord, going to take over. But let me tell you, it will always affect you. It will always affect you. And I don't care how hard somebody think they are. I don't care how much you got it together. I don't care how who you are. I don't care how many times you have been down range. I don't care how, how, how uh, 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 stone face you are. I've been pastoring for 28 years. This is my 28th year. And it still gets to me when I have to do a funeral. It still gets to me. It weighs heavy on me. I have to get my head together and get my flesh together before I deal with that family. Before I prayed with the Newton family on yesterday, I had to get myself together in the hallway so I could go in because if, if they sit up there holding me up and I'm laying down on the floor uh, crying and snotting, well, what did I come in there for? Now, not that I can't cry, and we're going to deal with that because people say, well, don't you cry. If you believe in God, you don't cry. Jesus wept, so I can weep too, so don't tell me not to cry. So you understand, that's why he gave me emotion. He gave me tears so they can come down my eyes. But when I'm in that capacity, I've got to be able to come and give comfort even if I don't have all the answers. 
When you're dealing with loss and grief, you've got to understand, especially when you are going to your brother, your sister, uh, your, 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 your children, your children's children, whoever you're dealing with, when I deal with those um, acolytes today, uh, we're talking all the way down to probably age uh, uh, 10 or, or so, they don't understand me quoting a whole bunch of scriptures. I've got to explain to them what the scriptures mean, but then come with a heart of compassion. And when you come with a heart of compassion, you got to realize you've got to t t point them back to Jesus rather than back to yourself. How many of you ever been angry when somebody died? Well, I'm glad y'all saved for the Holy Ghost. I, I've been angry before. I've been angry before. Not angry with God, angry with the situation. So now in my lamentation or my lamenting to God, it sounds like I'm mad at him. I'm not mad at him. I just know he's the only one got the answer. And he has the final say so. So sometimes the question is not why God, but you want to know how did this happen or, or why did this have to happen? Not God, why did you do it? Because we don't question God. But we often ask, Lord, well, why did this have to happen? Not why did you do this? But why did it have to happen? So we deal with this. And, and, and Jesus, therefore, God let Jesus go through suffering that we can have some kind of companionship. We can have some kind of parallel, some kind of comparability. And we go to um, um, uh, Hebrews 4, 15 through 16. Jesus 4, 15 through 16. And as they're finding that, it says, if you feel no one cares about your pain, Jesus does. If you think no one cares about your sorrow, Jesus cares. If you believe no one cares about your grief, Jesus cares. This is why he cares. And, and this is a powerful scripture, it says, in Hebrews uh, 4 and 15 uh, through 16. It says, for we do not have a high priest. Understand, who's, who's our high priest? Say it, y'all don't be scared. Jesus. Jesus is our high priest, all right, who was unable to empathize with our weakness or our suffering. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet did not what? Did not what? Next scripture, next verse 16. And it says this, let us therefore approach the throne of grace with confidence. Or the King James says, let us go boldly before the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time. Go back to 16. In our time of need. No, leave it right there at 16. It says, let us therefore come boldly before the throne of grace uh, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. So what he's saying is, uh, when we, you know, remember that old song, uh, Brother Collins, we used to sing it in the old church, Jesus knows all about our troubles. Now, when he deals with that, that is a true scriptural song because it proves it right there. In Hebrews, it tells us he's a high priest who had to go through some of the same things. God is so masterful in his making of creation from eternity to end time that he had such a mindset to let his son Jesus Christ come in the form of the flesh that we may be able to not say, oh, well, he's in heaven, he's in the cloud, he's an angel, he's above us. He walked on earth and went through the same things we did. He went through rejection. He went through sorrow. Y'all remember when he went to the house of his friend Lazarus? And when he went to the house of his friend Lazarus, guess what the his, uh, Lazarus' sister, Jesus' homegirl, said when he got there? It said this, Brother Norton. She said, if you'd have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Now he got to deal with attitude and the death of, of you know, amen. Y'all don't have to deal with attitude. If you want to see a family uh, uh, mess around and, and mess up, you let somebody pass and the family ain't got it together. Lord, have mercy, have mercy, have mercy. None of y'all families are like that. But I done seen some families that you let somebody pass away. You want to see the true colors come out? Oh, Lord. At tattoo, there has been some, well, praise the Lord. So, so the Lord told me to be a refrigerator, keep it sometime, all right? So I'm going to keep it, all right? You, you, because people will let their emotions overshadow their spirituality. And you've got to be very careful that you don't let the enemy creep in because what he will do, he will creep in because what you're doing, you're hurting. Grief is a hurt. It's a part of an emotional structure that it happens. Now, let me tell you, everybody goes through grief, but everybody handles it different. Everybody goes through grief, but everybody handles it different. I didn't see my father cry. I didn't see my father cry until I was in middle school. Never seen him cry. If, if he was in the army, uh, uh, sister, uh, town, he'd been a command sergeant, mate. He was straight, just right. 
tough. Just tough, didn't say nothing, nothing happened, anything brought, brought, uh, 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 brought face it, he was a picture of strength. But his best friend, they found him dead one Sunday afternoon after church. I'll never forget it. And we had to go down there. And I saw my dad come back home, and he was in the middle of the floor crying like a baby. I, I'd never seen it before. I'd never seen him cry. So since all of a sudden, I could not fathom my dad in the middle of the floor crying. But that was his best friend. So something had been hit in him that had never been touched before. And I didn't know what to say to him. I wouldn't even go near him because I was too stunned and me and my brother to see him even like that. But my mom got on her knees beside him and started to talk in his ear and started to whisper the word of God in his ear and start to tell him that I know this hurts, but God is going to be with you and God's going to make everything all right. And that's why I first, this long before seminary or even I thought about preaching, the stuff I was doing at that time, ain't no way in the world I would thought about preaching. I was sitting there watching. She was ministering in his ear, even though she didn't have all the answers. Know that when somebody is, 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 uh, is lost, somebody is, is dead, somebody has passed on, you ain't going to have all the answers. And please don't think because we've been to seminary or uh, Reverend McClain and I are preachers or any other preachers in the building, please, and Reverend Norton, please don't think we got all the answers. Sometimes all I can say is Jesus hears you. Jesus got you. I'm praying for you. Because I'm sorry, in 28 years I still ain't got all the answers. Sometimes I just sit in the corner hold my hands like this, stand at attention, and look up every once in a while to see if somebody needs me to just to pray with them, because you're not going to have all the answers. Now, that's dealing with other people. How about dealing with yourself? All right, what is healthy grieving? There's healthy grieving, and there's unhealthy grieving. All right, I want to deal with these real quick. Anytime somebody dies or passes on that is deeply meaningful for you, there is a process of grieving that you have to go through. And if you don't go through that grieving, now, y'all ever notice this? You ever been to a, a home going or to a person's house and the person, whether it be the husband, the wife, the mother, the father, the loved one, they don't cry. And somebody will say, they ain't cried yet. Now, what's wrong with them they ain't cried? That don't mean that they're insensitive. That don't mean that they don't care. But you understand something, they're going through their grieving process. And don't sit up and tell somebody when they got to cry or when they're not supposed to cry. I learned a long time ago that sometimes you've got to let that person work it out themselves with their God. And it does not mean, don't come to uh, erroneous assumptions saying because they're not in the flow. My dad, I told you that was the first time I've ever seen him cry in my life. We had many deaths before. Now, my great-grandfather had passed away. My, my, my grandmother had passed away. But I ain't never seen that happen before. That was his point of breaking, of grieving. That's the way it do. Now, somebody may pass today. My dad may touch his eye just like that and be done with it. But sometimes you've got to understand that everybody don't grieve the same way. All right? So that's, the, that's grief recovery. All right? Now understand this. I want to tell you this. Healthy grief, grief involves this. Accepting that the past will always be the past. You can't change it. You're not going to bring people back. And our flesh side wants to bring people back. But let me tell you something. I say this all the time at funerals. If you ask the person, do they want to come back? After they've seen Jesus and they have now got their reward, I bet you they say they don't want to come back. Now, that's not, I'm not being insensitive, but understand, have you heard what heaven is like? The streets are paved with gold. The walls are like jasper. There will be no more suffering. Every day will be Sunday and Sabbath will have no end. Uh, you, you leave. You ain't trying to come back. So understand that. Accepting, number two, the present offers stability. The stability of the time, knowing that God is still sustaining you to be here. Number three, accepting that the future holds promises of hope. So if God kept them, he will also keep you. Let's go to Psalms 34, 18 through 17. Psalms 34, 18 through 17. It says, uh, uh, let me look here. It says, the righteous cry out and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all of their what? That's the troubles is part of the grief process. All right, keep going. When the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit, or those, uh, one version says, of a contrite heart or a contrite spirit, God will hold that, and he gives you through that grieving process. All right? Um, somebody say, I got to learn to let go. <laughs> let go does not mean you don't remember. It does not mean you reminisce. 
anyone that I'm around that somebody passes, most of the time they're talking about the good times of what went on. So yesterday, as we sat around with, with the Newton family, Dr. Newton and his her uncle, uh, Reverend Stanley Williams, and, and, and her brother, Brother Nick, they were talking about old times. And I got a chance to learn a lot about her childhood by just listening. That brought comfort. Y'all ever seen that before? You get around when folks have passed away, your classmates or your cousins or somebody, and you start talking about the good time. Those things help you. There's no disrespect in talking about that. But you've got to understand, sometimes people keep talking. You might say, why do they keep talking about that? That's helping them grieve. That's having them remember the good time because that is no good time. I can preach all I want to about you going to heaven and the body's not there. Let me tell you, that can be depressing if you're not careful. You got to talk about the memories of what they were, but you, I've got to be able to let it go. When I say let it go, letting go means I've let my flesh release it so I'm not hooked to that because you, you, I've heard it before. People will come up and say, I want to go. I want to get in. I want to go with you. They don't really mean that. They really don't mean that. They really don't mean that. They don't mean no harm. They, they I want to go, and they try to jump in there. They don't want to do that. What they're doing is they're, that's an unhealthy grieving. And, and I'm, not, I'm not condemning them. I'm not, I'm not um, saying that they are bad. But what they is, they're so attached to the memory of the person that we don't blame them, but we all know they can't go. They, can, they can't go. They, can, they cannot do it. But that is a part of that that grieving process that we've got to understand something that we've got to let go, all right? Now understand this. You've got to talk about the history. I talked about that. Express the unfinished business. Some people say, I never got a chance to say I love you to that person. I should have done this, should have done that. Everything that needed to be said in the order of time was already said, and there's nothing you could have said to be able to keep them here. I'm going to just tell you that. Ain't nothing you could have said. All right. When you say that um, um, uh, quickly, um, Re Brother Trampas O'Kelly, a guy called me one night. I was um, young in the ministry. I think I was in my first year of ministry, brother. I remember, I'm 93, I think it was. He called me and asked me to come pray for his uh, his dad. And and I couldn't get there that night. And I said, I go tomorrow. And it was late. I'll never forget it. And it was late. And the next morning I got a call that he had died. That thing broke me, it hurt me so bad. Because at that time I was young in the ministry, young in the faith, I said, God, if I were there, it wouldn't have happened. He called me and I didn't go. It, I mean, it was late, it was like 10, 11 o'clock at night. He lived about an hour, I mean, about 30 minutes away. And you know how you do, you say, well, I'll come by tomorrow, I'll do it tomorrow. And, and I beat myself up for so long, but my pastor had to tell me at that time, Reverend Lawrence Turner, he said, son, ain't nothing you can do to stop the divine will and the plan of God. God was coming to get him that night, whether you came or not. Won't well, nothing you could do. And he asked me, was he saved? I said, yes, say. Well, he's, he with the Lord then. You were sitting up here beating up yourself for something you couldn't have changed. Let me tell you, nobody has control over death. I don't care if you're the doctor. Yesterday, um, well, not yesterday, Another time a doctor said to, to me, he said, uh, Reverend, I've done all I can do. Right now it's in the Lord's hands. And he was saying that about one of our members who was about to transition. He said, it's in the Lord's hands. And, and if the Lord works a miracle, then this person, he will live. But however, medical science is all I've taught me. I've done everything, everything that the book has told me to do. Now it's time for us to go to the one who is able to sustain or receive life to himself. That was a doctor saying that. Everybody should have a doctor with that kind of mindset. He said that, and that person passed away about two, two, two hours later. He realized there wasn't nothing he could do. I realized there wasn't nothing you could do. I want to tell y'all something. Ain't nothing you can do when it's God's timing. Ain't, ain't nothing you can do. But we've got to understand with the let it go. Choose to forgive whatever offenses may be still harboring and let go of revenge. You've got to let that go. Because what you do, if that person is gone, why are you still sitting here mad? They owed you $200. Well, you should have got it. You should have got it last year. And you go, oh, they mad. They still owe me. If you are, are, are so hard up for the $200, you shouldn't have gave it to them. You can't hold on to that grief. You're going to spend the sleepless nights. You can't. You got to let it go. Everybody say, let it go. Release, release the past. Commit, uh, uh, commit to cease from trying to make it your part of your present and your future. Uh, Job 11 and 16. Job 11 and 16. Job 11 and 16. You will surely forget your trouble, recalling it only as waters gone by. You got, you got to wash your hands of it. 
That don't mean you can't remember. That can't mean you don't mean you don't post a picture. That don't mean that you cannot put them on your screensaver. But understand something, if that person still controls you day and night, if you still waking up in the middle of the night, haunted in your sleep because you see them sitting on your bed, if you're sitting there scared to go outside in the dark or scared to go to the graveyard because you think they're going to meet you there, you ain't let it go. That you can have a sweet memory without letting your flesh hold on to the point. And if there's anything that you said wrong to them or did wrong to them, guess what? They don't have the power to forgive you. God has the power to give you. So you got to let that thing go because sometimes it's to the fact where somebody know, do you know you didn't do what you were supposed to do or you said something you weren't supposed to say. You go to God and say, well, I can't never be forgiven now because that person's gone and they can't hear me. Go to God in prayer and God is able to forgive you, all right? All right, accept your present. Accept your present. This part of the grief process. The present offers stability and significance. Number one, choose to live one day at a time. We're going to go to Matthew 6 and 34. Matthew 6 and 34. Matthew 6 and 34. This is after loss and grief in your life. Matthew 6 and 34. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. There is some other thing that will come in your life that will not let you forget that person's life. But what it's going to do is you're going to realize life is going to have to go on. That don't mean I can't honor that person. That don't mean that I, um, we're putting up a, um, well, an acolyte chair in the, uh, in, the, in the sanctuary with the crucifix cross and the tapers beside it. That's what you light and put out the candles with, with a, with a chair that is draped in black. We're doing that out of honor of her years of service in this church as an acolyte in serving God and as a minister of the gospel. We're going to put that right there. Now, that's going to sit there a few days. Then after a week or so, we're going to pull that down. Not because that we do not reverence uh, the fact that Jesus Christ allowed her to be here with us, but that was our time to commemorate and honor her life. But guess what? Life has to continue. Life has to continue. And that's not insensitive. You've got to understand something. You are living for life, not trying to live for death. Because if we are Christians and we all are Christians, we understand something. This ain't our final resting place. I, I'm not, I, the, the song said, I'm living to live again. So therefore, I'm living this side until the Lord gets through with me on this side. Then he gives me an eternal reward where I can do like 2 Timothy 4. Say, I, fight, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I've kept the faith. Beyond this place lays in store for me a crown of righteousness. That is our hope. So we have to do that. So we got to live one day at a time. Number two, put the Lord at the center of your life. Now, the Lord will spill any void. Now, that don't mean you ain't going to remember. How many, how many of you have been in a situation where you had a death in your life and it felt like a hole was in your chest? Felt like a hole was in. Yesterday, it felt like somebody punched me in my chest. And when I told my wife, it felt like somebody, she, she took a, <gasps> I mean, it just, it, you know, even though we knew it may come until it happens, and all of you know what I'm talking about if you've been through death, that thing feels like somebody hit you in your chest and, or a hurt that don't seem like it's going to stop. But how many can also realize it still affects you, but it don't hurt like it used to hurt you? Because day by day, God will take some of that off of you, but you got to put him at the center. If you put death at the center, that's what you're going to be able to reap. But if you put life and choose life and understand, I'm going to live my life according to the will and the word of God, that that way, that where they are, I may be also. That's Matthew 16, 24. Matthew 16, 24. Matthew 16, 24. Then Jesus said unto the disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up thy cross and do what? Follow him. To follow him, that means you got to put him at the center of your life. You will find out. Now, again, I, I am not criticizing. I am not uh, uh, castigating anybody who's still going through grief. All of us go through grief. We just go through it a different way. The issue is when Jesus is the center of your life, um, when it talks about the heathen walk around uh, for days with their sackcloth rent and all they do is cry and moan and complain about what's happened. But though, that's those who have no hope. But those of us that have hope know that one day uh, he's coming through on a cloud. And when he cracks the sky, the dead in Christ shall be rise first, and those that remain alive in him shall be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. And at the end it says, comfort ye one another with these words. I got to have G Jesus the only hope I got. 
He, at the end of the day, it's the only hope that I got. That's why the scripture says, in him I have my what? Moving and my being, all right? Number three, God with your, uh, excuse me, go to God with specific questions. Go to God with specific questions. Let's read James 1, 5, and then I'm going to come to this. If any of you lack wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault. And it will be given unto you. Everybody's got questions. You go to your preacher. You go to, to your prayer partner. You go to your neighbor. Nobody, and I'm going to just tell you this. I'm going to give you this for free. I don't care who, I don't care if it's the bishop. I don't care if it's the pope. I don't care if it's the archbishop or the chief apostle. Ain't none of us going to have the answer on why, when, and where. That's not going to have it. That, that, you ever seen to the point where you see young people who you think going to live a long time, and for some reason they don't, or you find an older person who has been sick many times and they still kicking? You can't answer that question. It's all about God's time. You're not going to have the answer. You're not going to have the answer, so you're going to have to go to God. Well, pastor, he don't answer me. Let me tell you, God always answers, but you got to have ear to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to you. Because sometimes you're looking for man's answers rather than God answers. Let me say that again. Sometimes you're looking for the flesh rather than the spirit. The spirit is always going to give you hope and consolation. But your flesh is always going to be saying, but why? But what next? Well, why not? Well, why not? I heard somebody say one time, well, it should have been me. I understand what you're saying. I do understand what you're saying. But no, it should not have been you. That person has their life to live. You've got your life to live. And God ain't promised no time. When we deal with the scripture in the Old Testament, the days of our years, three score years and ten, if they be four score years, they be strength, labor, and sorrow, then we'll soon cut off and we fly away. The, the, when, when we talk about, you know, I had somebody ask me about uh, Mo, I mean, Methuselah, uh, 900 and something years old. That's called the antediluvian period. Then you come back down to the, uh, where people started living about 120 years. Then you come back to when they started dealing, with, when you deal with the three score years and 10, if there's a reason of strength, there'd be four score, which is 80 years old. Let me tell you something. There is no set time for man or woman. There is no set time. What you've got to do is understand something. As long as I trust God's timing, all things work for together for the, together for the good of them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Uh, the next one, we're not going to go to this scripture. You've got it in your handout. Thank God for providing everything you need for your life. Praise God through your situation has changed. Though your situation has changed, he will never leave. And then focus on joy and the sacrifices of helping others. Now, I want to go through this because I want to get to the next uh, point here. Emotional guidelines. Let's go to emotional guidelines. That should be on that page or your next page. Y'all see that? All right. And those who are watching us virtually, you can go to simontemple.com and go into downloads and you can get this emotional guides. All right. Have strong, sensitive support system. You need somebody. You can't do this by yourself. Now, I'm telling you now, when Elijah, when he messed around and got the email from Jezebel, Jezebel he was in grief. This joker said, I, I want to die. And he went under the juniper tree and the Lord came and said, what you doing here? It won't good for him to be by himself. He needed somebody. So the scripture tells us in Proverbs 27, 17, Proverbs 27, 17, it says, as iron sharpens iron, so no man sharp, so one man sharpens the other. So as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens the other. You've got to be able to help people. There are people in this room who've had to deal with grief before. And you will sometimes be a better spiritual counselor than the pastor, the minister of music, the leader of leaders, because you have something in common with that person. They lost someone. That don't mean you have, most of the time when people have person to die, they don't want you to give them the answers. They just want you to listen. They just want you to sit there and listen, cry with them a little bit, talk about the goodness of Jesus and console them. That's iron sharpening iron. We are the people of God, so we help one another. That's what you have to do. You have to be able to do that. I'll give you an example. Um, one, one, somebody called me from uh, California and said, can I call Dr. Newton? Uh, can you give me a number called Dr. Newton? I said, you, you can have a number, but don't call him. This was yesterday. And I told him, uh, uh, don't call him till tomorrow. And they said, well, I, I want to call him today and let him know my condolences. I said, he can't hear you. Bro, bro, bro Newby, I told him, you, he can't hear you. I said, he can't hear you today. He's trying to process this. 
He's trying to get this through his head, even though he, he, he's a, you know how strong Dr. Newton is. Dr. Newton is a man of faith. He's a man of the Lord. He's straight in the word. He's going to be rightly dividing the word of truth. But you, you act like that don't hurt. I don't care. I don't care. You know scripture from the rooter to the tutor. When things happen to you, that thing will deal with your flesh or deal with your emotions. It don't mean you're unspiritual, but people have to go through that process. So I told the person, don't, no, wait, wait after 12 tomorrow. Uh, call him then and don't get offended if he don't answer. And they said, well, I, I just need, I said, you don't need, ain't nothing you can say today that's going to be able to bring her back or be able to, he can't hear you right now. He, he needs to process and start his grieving process. And you call him tomorrow. So, and, and so it's not being insensitive. And, and I'm not saying Dr. Newton was being stuck up or arrogant or, or being standoffish. He won't do that. And I'm not sure if he answered the call. Now, I don't care. I don't know if the person called. Now, I don't know. But I'm trying to give him that advice to be able to let people have time to be able to do that. He needs that iron to sharpen iron, but sometimes the cut is too fresh for you to be able to sharpen it. You understand what I'm saying? When it's fresh, you got to be real careful with people because they are dealing with their emotions. And emotions is something that God gives us, all right? I think I helped somebody on that one if I don't say nothing else today, all right? Have freedom to cry. This one I want to deal with. Have freedom to cry. Uh, uh, go ahead and deal with Psalms 126 and 5. Psalms 126 and 5. Bring that up for me. 126 and 5. Those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. It's all right to cry. And don't tell nobody they can't cry. That's a way of them releasing that. Let them sit there and moan and don't try to make them cry because they ain't because they got to work in the timing of their grief process. All right. Um, number, 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 the next one, have a plan for socializing regularly. Hebrews 10, 25, let us not give up meeting together, but let us encourage one another. It says not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more you can see the day approaching. You've got to get back in it. Y'all ever seen anybody uh, go into a mode where they want to be around nobody? They ain't want to talk to nobody close the curtains, wouldn't come out. Now that's, I've got to give them that time. You got to give them that time. And then brothers and sisters, if you got a friend or you got a, a sister girl, you got a homeboy that you know going through and they're in that thing, go get them. And when I say go get them, don't bombard, but make yourself available. You got to get them out. I don't care if it's going, they may not come. I've had persons, and I'll use this example because she won't mind, uh, a sister Rembrandt. We were in Bible study in this church. This is the church we had at the time. We still had pews in here and everything. Her husband, Brother Hampton Rembrandt, was right here in this church sitting about where Brother Newbill is. He had a, 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 he passed away right there during Bible study. EMS came in, uh, took him away. Uh, son and daughter uh, went over, we went over to the hospital. Brother Rembrandt, faithful servant of the Lord, retired soldier, class leader, Sunday school teacher, gone right here in the church. Sister Rembrandt said, it was hard for me to come back in here because we hadn't moved over there yet. We were still over here. And she said, it was hard for me to come back in there. But I know who I get my strength from. My strength comes from God. And this is a reminder, yes, of his death, but it's also that he has everlasting life. And she said, uh, Pastor, I love Hamp, as she called him, H-A-M, -E Hamp, instead of Hampton, Hamp. I love Hamp, but I got to keep living. That is not to dishonor or disrespect his life, but I understand something, that if I want to live, I got to have everlasting life. So I've got to come to the house of worship. That was a strong statement from her, because she realized she could not forbid the assembling of the saints. She had to get back in the game. And even though she would have had a right to be able to say, I can't, y'all, can y'all, can y'all imagine that? You're going back into the place, not only where your husband passed away, but also where his funeral was. But yet she took a little time and she was right back in here worshiping. Everybody can't do that immediately. But notice what she did. She said, I got to get back with the saints. I got to get back with the people because I understand something. He had to go and he had to go somewhere. And when he had to go, I'm glad he was able to go and be with the Lord. 
All right? So I'm just using real examples because, you know, sometimes we give a lot of antidotes and folks say, well, that's good on paper. I'm talking about stuff that actually happened. And let me tell you, it, ha it will happen to all of us one way, form, or fashion. All right? Let's go a couple of more here. Have a trustworthy, honest confidence. Have a trustworthy, honest confidence. That is, uh, that is uh, uh, Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 10. Have a trustworthy, confident, honest confidence. Two are better than one because they have good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who fails, falls and has no one to help them up. You need a confidant. You need a friend. Not somebody going to sit there and let you stay in the grave or let you stay on your back. You need somebody who's going to get you up. Somebody who can be positive. Uh, I've had many pastors call me and text me over the last 24 hours. Uh, not even 24 hours. I've had more calls and texts from pastors um, um, in the last, uh, well, not 20, yeah, almost 24 hours than I've had in a long time. And, and what they're saying is, Pastor, we're praying for you. We know this affects you. We know this is hurting you. We're in a, and if usually they start out with, we tell Dr. Newton we're praying for him, da, 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 da. But Pastor, I know this is heavy on you. This is a load on you. Because people don't see sometimes the people whose load it gets hit on the fringes. Now, I don't in any way try to be able to compare that pain with the pain of Reverend Newton or of Sister Jones' daughter. Or other, I, I'm not trying to say that. What I'm saying is, at that point, you need some confidants who are going to encourage you. I don't need nobody to lift me. Jesus is the lifter of my head. I don't need nobody to give me joy because the joy of the Lord is my strength. But let's be real. Sometimes you just need to know somebody cares. You just need to know somebody cares about what you're going through. All right? We almost through here. Number, um, um, uh, I want to deal with this one. Uh, have your resentment released. Ephesians 4.32. Ephesians 4.32. Ephesians 4.32. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ, God, forgave you. There's got to be that forgiveness, not only for yourself, but for the other person. Now, I ain't going to ask you to raise your hand. Has you ever had anybody who died that did you wrong, and they never got it right before they left here? You got to let that thing go, because you know what you're going to do? They gone, and they with the Lord, and you still sitting here with that burden on your heart. You got to let it go. You will never get out of the grieving process if you're still holding people accountable for stuff that they've done and that they're dead and they can't answer for it. Let it go. Everybody say, let it go. Let it go. All right. Spiritual guidelines. I'm going to just read. We got, we got to go. I'm going to give you two of these and then we're going to go. De de develop a purposeful pr prayer life. Develop a purposeful prayer life. That's Psalms 119.26. 119.26. 119.26. And this is what it says. I gave an account for my ways and you answered me. Teach me your decrees. I've got, you can't wait till somebody pass or you're going through loss and grief to start praying. You got to start praying right now because things will happen in your life where you're going to need and develop that prayer life. And especially when times of death come. All right. Uh, develop a yearning for eternity. You developing a yearning for eternity helps you understand that that person's in eternity. And by you yearning to be there, it's still going to hurt, but at least you say that person is already gone where I'm trying to get to. Next one, develop a positive, practical perspective. It says whatever things are true, whether things are noble, whether things are right, whatever things are pure, whether things are lovely, whatever things are admirable, think on these things. You got to think on things that are positive. You got to think on things positive. And last one, develop a sense of peace about the past. Develop a, 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 a sense of peace about the past. Uh, go, go to uh, 1 John 1, 9, uh, AV, uh, mini, uh, Medium Ministry. Uh, AV, I mean, um, 1 John 1, 9. 1 John 1, 9. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Develop a sense of peace about the past. Whatever you've done, whatever it is, that can, see, if you got a lot of weight on you and then grief comes on you, it's going to be hard to shake that because you ain't got rid of the first thing yet. That's why you got to be careful how you care around resentment, care around trouble, care around jealousy, envy, and strife. Because then when that weight of grief comes, it's hard to shake that stuff off your back. 
it's hard to get rid of it because you're carrying too much. You've got to release it. The Bible tells us in Hebrews, I think that's uh, Hebrews 12, uh, lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset, beset you. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith. You've got to let that thing go. Well, pastor, that's really insensitive. You tell me, let it go. I didn't say forget. I said, let it go. You cannot keep holding on to that thing because if you do, it will not allow you to go forward. Use it to fuel where you're trying to go. Use it to fuel the thing that is holding you down. And say, so, you know what? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I remember so-and-so, and I remember so-and-so, and I remember what so-and-so did. And, and, and I honor the life of, 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 of Reverend uh, Adrian Newton, who, who went through a lot of procedures and had a lot of sickness, but didn't let on. And a lot of people knew, but they didn't know how much she was suffering or how much she was going through. And Dr. Newton and her, as a tag team, would make sure they kept pressing and they'd watch out for each other. And he, he'd take her to the appointments and he'd text me and say, Pastor, you got an appointment, they got a procedure today. You know, I ain't saying this for you to be able to put it out. Just need my pastor to cover us and pray. Boom, 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 give me the thing. She'd be recovering, he'd come back to work, do, do all of that. But the time came where she had to slip away. And, 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 and while we honor her life, her life, is no more special than any of your loved one's life, or no more special than my loved one's life. But now this is hit home. This is hit home because it's right here. And it was unexpected. And that's when, it, let me tell you, I don't care if somebody has been sick in the hospital for five months, or they went in one day and passed the next day. You can never prepare for somebody to leave here. How many of you know folk been, been, been sick a long time? And you said, well, I know they're going to pass. I know they're going to pass. But when you get the news, uh, that thing will hurt you. And, and as a, it, it hurt. It will hurt you. I don't care what you prepare. I don't care how you get your mind together. You can have the, the service made out. You can have the insurance policy where it needs to be. You can have the, the dress or the, or the suit you're going to put on, the, the brother or the sister. You can't prepare for that. But you can prepare your heart. You can prepare your heart. And so when he says, let not, I'm going right back to the scripture, a good, uh, a good scripture uh, thesis, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believeth in the Father, believeth also in me, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go away to prepare a place for you, that where I am, ye may be also. So my, my trouble, now I'm going to tell you, that hit my heart, it hit my chest, it, it hurt me, but I understand She's got everlasting life. And if I'm going to have the same everlasting life, I've already made it up. I made it up with my Lord and Savior. But now I've got to continue to run on and see what the end is going to be. And I want to tell each and every one of you, and each and every one of you, you've got to run on and see what the end is going to be. Because your time is coming. My time is coming. You don't know when it's coming. But when he does come, I want to be found precious in his sight where I'm able to, when he opens up the windows of heaven, and said, so, come on up a little higher, Brian Thompson. When he said, come on up, I'm noon, they about to come on up a little higher. He says, here's your reward. He said, go into the joys of the Lord. There's your grandma over there. There's your brother over there. There's your grandchild over there. there there's Reverend so-and-so over there. Come on in. Every day is going to be like Sunday. You won't have no more aches and pains. You won't have to pay no more taxes. You won't have to deal with the Democrats or the Republicans. You won't have to deal with crazy folk, crazy neighbors. You won't have to worry about nothing. You won't have to worry about cancer, diabetes. You won't have to worry about nothing. All you got to do is, get what he say? All you got to do is stand around the throne saying, holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of thy glory. So that's what we do and deal with joy and grief. I mean, loss and grief. And let me tell you, it will affect you but it will not overtake you. It will not overtake you. Love, grace, and peace be unto you. And I'm praying especially for the Newton family, Jones family, and any other family that's been affected by death. Please don't make light of it. Please don't make light of it. Check on your neighbors, check on your friends, because guess what? It will visit your house. It will visit your family. You got to understand something. It will visit you. But when you know you've got Christ Jesus, everything's going to be all right. If you're out there listening to me and you know you're not saved, let me just tell you this. You got to say, Lord Jesus, I've spent my life up at this point sinning against you. Lord Jesus, please forgive me of my sins. I believe 
that you are the son of God and I believe that God had raised you from the dead and please come into my heart and make my heart your home and make you the head of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, we believe that you got saved. Call us at 855-979-9804 and there's people waiting to pray for you and, and be your iron that sharpens iron and be the ones that will be able to console you while you go through. But most of this, that you can receive everlasting life. We believe that we've got some new kingdom dwellers today. And if there's anybody in the sanctuary who have not given their life to Christ, you can come give your life to Christ. Because let me tell you something. Going to church does not guarantee you going to heaven. You've got to be born again. You've got to be born again. And, and, and the reason I know I'm living this life to live again, I ain't perfect. I come short of the glory of God, same you as me. But I know I've got a reward in heaven. That's my assurance today. So we're praying for everybody out there who's going through the spirit of grief, who for some reason, it, you cannot shake it. It still haunts you for some reason in your spirit. It still overtakes your mind. I come against that spirit right now in the name of Jesus, that every negative thought that comes in your mind about the loss of your loved one, your friend or acquaintance, I pray right now with that bad spirit that will be overtaken by the spirit of God and that you will still remember that person and you will still be able to commemorate their life and honor that they have gone on to be with the Lord, but it shall not hold you and it shall not hold you back. That from this day forward, out of the words of the mouth of this prophet, I declare right now in the name of Jesus that your joy is going to be full. And even though some tears may fall from your eyes, weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. I pray, Lord, for the remembrance of those things that you can't understand, why the death happened. You wish it wouldn't have happened. You, you're still trying to wrap your mind around why it had to happen. I pray right now in the name of Jesus that he will give you peace even when you don't understand. And I pray the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall uh, continue to overtake your mind and hearts until the day of Jesus Christ. And that you and I will be able to be right that when he comes back, that we will get lay hold on everlasting life. I pray, Lord, right now for the spirit of grief and loss, that as people go through it, it shall not hold them, but we shall have joy and everlasting life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you. Have a good day. Amen. Thank you.